the poem for today, which you will find below the screen, you might have to scroll down to find it, is um, a poem that I dare say, at least certainly in America, is a very famous poem. I first read it in high school and uh, didn't, didn't really understand it. I'm not sure I understand it now, but I keep coming back to it. The poem is Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening by Robert Frost. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake, the only other sounds, the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. Uh, the woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Now, oftentimes when I'm reading a poem, I repeat the last line or the last few lines. I sort of feel like a little bit in the poem. I did not repeat the last line. Frost repeats the last line. He has promises to keep and he concludes and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. Emphasizing, if you will, the, the, the pull that he faces by the promises pulling against the aesthetic experience or the experience of the quiet, downy flakes, the woods filling up with snow. There is, let me begin by referring you some 12 years ago, Rav Aaron Lichtenstein Zatzal on Tu Bishvat in Yeshiva Teretzion uh, gave a sicha on this poem. Tu Bishvat, obvious. And it has been uh, uh, translated or summarized and translated into English and available on the virtual-based Midrash of Yeshivat Haratzion. And I will refer to it, um, but it's well worth reading the entire, the entire Sicha. Rav Aaron begins, what is the proper way to relate to an artistic creation? And of course, if we're talking about a relationship to an artistic creation, we're talking about relationship to this poem. But of course, the question is much larger. And the question that is the larger question is how, what is the proper way to relate to creation? And specifically, of course, to the beauty and allure of creation. And if, if one wants, you can summarize in, in a word the dilemma of the person who is on his way somewhere to do something that he must do and the pull of the beauty of nature that he could witness by watching the woods fill up with snow. You can say it is the dilemma or the pull between Beauty, on the one hand, and duty, obligation, on the other hand. And so, what is it to be in life? Is it to be the call of duty or the call of beauty? There is a passage in Doom, 
by Dostoevsky that, and do you know, do you know that mankind can live without the Englishman? It can live without Germany. It can live only too well without the Russian man. It can live without science, without bread, and it only cannot live without beauty. <laughs> we could live without bread, <laughs> but we couldn't live without beauty. So a person is on, on his way and stops, stops to contemplate, to admire this beauty. Well, we have a Mishnah in Pirkei Avot that says, talks about a person on the way. In, in the third parak, the seventh Mishnah, we have Rabbi Yaakov, or Rabbi Shimon, saying the following thing, Hamahalech Baderech, a person is on the way, the, and he is learning, he is studying, let us say he's, as he's walking along, he's reviewing Mishnayot. Umafsik mi Mishnato, and he and he interrupts his learning because he sees a beautiful tree and says, Mana e ilanze. Oh, how beautiful is this tree. Mana e nirze, how beautiful is this furrowed field. field. Harize mitchayev benafsho. He is, he is obligated in his very life. And on the other hand, what he is looking at is undoubtedly the work of God, his nature, which is described. The fact of the matter is that whatever else the Eitz Hadat Tovara was, the tree of knowledge, it was described as Nechmad Limare. It was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful tree. And we have Chazal telling us that there are, when we see various things in nature that bespeak ultimate kind of, an ultimate or, or a, a peak of beauty, we make a bracha on this. So what are we to make of this? What is it to be? When, when the poem the poem is an artistic creation, but this is a poem about creation and the artistry, the supreme and majestic artistry that we find drawing us magnetically into its spell, the work of God, the starry sky, the vast ocean. Which, which is it to be? Of course, Rav Aaron refers to the work of Soren Kierkegaard, either or, which presents, in as it were, uh, two two books: one, either, which represents the path of beauty, and the other, or, which went, represents the path of morality. It's perhaps not exactly so, because in the path of beauty, uh, we find that the path of beauty is being used for specifically immoral purposes. That's the, and on the other hand, Kierkegaard, who wrote in two voices in this, a, on a pseudonym, a different pseudonym in both, um, the, the, uh, the uh, either reads is a much more beautiful work than the, than the or. Um, here, actually, is a, is a um, an issue, depending on how you read the ch second chapter of the Guide for the Perplexed. The Rambam, who in the first chapter, argues that the unique quality of man is intellect. In the second chapter, he addresses a question by somebody who can't understand 
how it was that if they sinned, Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, by eating the tree, how come they were rewarded with intellect? And uh, Eitzadat, the tree of knowing, to be able to distinguish. And the Rambam answers, first he gives a sharp rejoinder to the man who asks the question, and but his answer is as follows, that intellect with which they were created was the ability to discern between true and false, between emet and sheker. And the etzada tovara is the distinction, is to make distinctions between tov and ra, between something that is good and something that is evil. The question, though, is what, the, what does the Rambam mean by that? And one way of reading the Rambam is they became concerned with issues of morality. Issues of morality cannot be shown by the logic of scientific, logical thought to be true or false. So tov represents morality. What is the good way? What is virtue? And so on and so forth. The other reading of this text is that Tovara are issues of beauty. They are aesthetic issues rather than ethical issues. And once again, there is no standard of true and false, no rational, logical way of arguing that this work of art is more beautiful or more profound than another work of art. And this, this issue of truth and beauty, of course, once again, uh, we refer to, to poetry. It's uh, in Keats, John Keats, Ode on a Grecian Urn. And the question is whether or not truth and beauty are in fact the same. Is beauty in and of itself truth? Um, I would say that looking at the at the poem, looking at the poem, there is, I would say, it's not either or. It isn't either or. There's a decision made, but nonetheless, the person on the journey does stop to look at the woods filling up with snow. The, the, the poem as a creation, as an artistic creation, has an, a, 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 what I think is, is an incredible beauty in the very sound of the poem. One can almost hear the snow falling and one can hear the call, the interruption of this silent moment uh, by, by uh, the call of duty. And the poet represents this by the sounds. Remember, this is silent. It's in the woods. There's nothing. There's only the sound of the sibilant sounds of the snow falling. And then there is the static sound. Static. Both the sibilant and the plosive sound which wakes me up, if you will, out of the reverie, out of my involvement with what I'm seeing. And uh, I counted up the plosives in this poem uh, and found that there were 47 plosives, but only 20 sibilants. And in the end, the plosives really are introduced strongly by this horse. The horse gives his harness bells a shake to ask. And in the end, that, that is the call. That is the call. And in the end, the words are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep. And those promises stand above the call of the woods. There are miles to go before I sleep. 
I have to be on my way before I can enter the world of sleep. Ravaran's last sentence in this uh, Sikha, at least as it's presented, talking about the call of beauty and the call of duty, he knows well that the call of beauty is no insignificant call. Beauty calls because it in and of itself is profound, is meaningful. And he says, it is easy to devote yourself to Torah if you are convinced that everything else is nonsense. Nonsense Nonsense is easy to give up for one who sees the beauty in God's creation. Nonsense is easy to give up, I'm sorry, but one who sees the beauty in God's creation, who comes to love it, must be strong in order to devote himself to learning Torah. One must not divorce the world, but rather bear in mind one's lover's quarrel with the world. And of course, he's referring to to um, Frost's line that he had a lover's quarrel with the world. The world beckons. The world beckons. It has a siren song, but not a siren song of evil, a siren song of beauty. It will not necessarily lead to evil, but it might. That which leads to good is always the promise that we make, our obligation to the other. And, of course, our seeing of the, the world when we're not mafsik as the ultimate beauty of God's creation. And let me end with a story. Uh, when I was about uh, 16 years old, and we had moved to Montreal, uh, Rav Tzvi Yehuda Meltzer, Zichrona Livrocha, came to Montreal uh, to raise money for Yeshivat Hadarim. And my father um, was taking him around to various uh, wealthy people, I guess, and there was a break in the schedule. So Rav Tzvi Yehuda asked my father what there might be of interest in Montreal, and my father suggested that he would like to see, he would enjoy seeing the botanical gardens of Montreal. And my father asked me if I would like to come along. So I said, okay. So there we are, this is Montreal in the summer of 19, 1960, and uh, there weren't too many uh, Rabbonim in the bot botanical garden then, I don't know if there are ever a lot of Rabbanim, but there weren't too many Rabbanim, certainly not dressed in a long black coat with tzitzis hanging out at the bottom, a big black hat, <laughs> and walking with a book, a black book in their hand, okay? And uh, as we went through the greenhouses, we somehow became separated, and I realized, my father realized actually, that we were missing... Rav Meltzer. So he asked me to run back through the greenhouses to find what, ha what had happened to him. And I went through one greenhouse, maybe two greenhouses, and I come to eventually, let us say, the third greenhouse, and I saw there was a crowd gathered at, around a particular, a particular uh, plant. Beautiful plant. And the, the, in the crowd, the crowd were was composed of a, a whole bunch of people who were watching this person. Maybe they, maybe they had seen a plant like this, but they had never seen anybody who looked like this before, who was saying aloud something in a foreign language from a black book. And I came closer, and of course, it was Rav Meltzer. And of course, the book, which my father had lent him, I still have the safer. It's the commentary of the Rabbi Avram, the son of the Vilna Gaon, 
on Tehillim, which he had bought, borrowed from my father. Um, and and he, it was open to Barchi Nafshi, that psalm in Tehillim that we say, we, we regularly know we say it, Shabbos by Mincha, on uh, Yosh Chodesh, the Shir Shal Yom, and it's about the beauty of God's creation. And he was standing in front of this plant and speaking of God's creation and the beauty thereof. And the crowd was watching him. And I was learning something about what it means to say to Hillim, what it means to say a bracha on creation. How lovely, how lovely is the beauty of the snow falling in the woods and the plant growing in the botanical garden.